everybody doing today? Welcome to the next to last broadcast for the summer of Psychology 150. It's Dr. Roddenberry coming to you from the uh, attic of my friend's house here at the Chautauqua Institution in Western North Carolina, in Western New York. How's everybody doing today? Got my big cup of coffee, got my trusty laptop, and I am ready to go today. So how's everybody doing? It's good to see you. Thanks for coming today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about chapter 15 today and tomorrow, and that will end this course's lecture. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I uh, hope that everybody's doing well. We're going to talk a little bit about who treats psychological disorders. We're going to talk about generally about the three broad approaches to treatment, and then we're going to talk about cognitive behavioral therapy today. That's our goals for today. <laughs> I hope you're having a nice day and ready to get started as well. So, um, if you remember, we talked a little bit about this uh, the other day, and I talked to you about who treats uh, psychological disorders, and there are a lot of uh, different kinds of psychological disorder uh, treatment professionals. Uh, we talked about clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, and counseling psychologists. The other day, and those are the three broad categories of people that are going to treat psychological disorders. If you remember, the psychiatrist is the only one that can can uh, prescribe medication because the psychiatrist is actually a medical doctor and not a psychologist. It's a medical doctor who specializes in the treatment of psychological disorders. Then we have the clinical psychologist. Uh, and I told you that clinical psychologists could either have a PhD or a PsyD, depending upon whether or not their program makes them do research as well as clinical training. And then I suggested to you that counseling psychologists um, are the ones who treat the less serious adjustment disorders. So we have family counselors, uh, uh, we have marriage counselors, we have uh, occupational uh, uh, marriage counselors, family counselors, um, uh, drug counselors. Um, and so these are your counseling psychologists. And I suggested to you that they might have a PhD or they might have a master's degree, depending upon the program that they go to. Now, these are the three broad character, character, uh, characters that you're going to meet in the treatment of psychological disorders. But there are also... Uh, psychiatric social workers, psychiatric nurses, and other paraprofessionals. Uh, psychiatric uh, social workers are going to have uh, um, social work experience and clinical psych experience, but their job is to um, sort of help people not only with their psychological disorders, but also uh, how to navigate the system to obtain resources, how to treat the problems that they may be having. So your psychiatric social worker is going to be sort of a mix. It's a social worker that helps somebody uh, get resources that they need uh, from the community, but they're also going to uh, be a mental health professional as well. And then we have psychiatric nurses. Um, and so they have the BSN degree, the nursing degree, and then they have a, a special training in the care of clients with psychological disorders. Uh, for those of you who are nurses at some point, who are on the nurse track at some point, you will meet a patient that has both a medical problem and a psychological problem. Psychiatric nurses are some of the experts that can help depending upon the setting that you happen to find yourself in. So these are the providers of psychological treatment as we mentioned earlier. Okay. Now we'll go uh, with the next slide. All right, so what's in the toolbox? What can, what do clinical psychologists, what do uh, uh, PsyDs, psychiatrists, and your counselors have to treat people with psychological disorders? They have three broad tools in the tool book. To, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, two broad, two, two broad sort of uh, tools in the toolbox, okay? We have biological therapy, and uh, I've actually been talking about therapy and the things that help us do therapy all semester long, 
because the treatment of psychological disorders, that is what we find in chapter 15, is based on other stuff that we've already learned in this chapter. So clinical psychology, the treatment for psychiatric disorders, uh, does not come out of nowhere. It actually is built from the psychological tradition that we've already talked about. So if you remember in chapter 2, we talked about neurotransmitters. We talked about bio biology, biological parts of the brains. We talked about uh, um, uh, specialization, uh, functional areas in the brain. We talked about connectivity between those areas in the brain. And so one set of treatments that clinical psychologists and other mental health professionals have is the ability to uh, affect the uh, structure and function of the brain in an attempt to disrupt someone's psychological disorders. So biological therapy says it's a neuropsychological problem. Let's fix that brain area. Let's fix that chemical or electrical input that's causing the problem. And that will uh, help the psychological problem go away. Three sort of broad approaches to that. There's the drug therapy. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the idea of antipsychotics, antidepressants, anti-anxiety agents. Uh, people who uh, take drug therapy um, are trying to treat the uh, chemicals in the brain. They're trying to change chemical imbalances in the brain. Um, also, deep brain stimulation, where thin electrodes are implanted into the brain and attached to pacemakers underneath a person's skin, uh, uh, underneath the skin in the chest area, has also been used to, to, uh, to uh, treat some disorders that are related to tremoring. Uh, we get the uh, Parkinson's disease, some essential tremors, uh, people with, um, uh, oh my goodness, where you yell out and scream, the, uh, where you yell out and scream obscenities, Tourette syndrome. Uh, these are all treated uh, using electrical stimulation. Uh, actually, depression. There are people who use uh, electrical shock therapy to treat uh, depression. And so uh, some of these therapies uh, relate to the electrical properties of the brain. And then, of course, uh, there are some examples of psychosurgery where people go in and adjust, maybe cut out pieces of the brain, um, uh, make changes to the structural part, uh, organization of the brain in order to help people uh, not suffer from psychological disorders. So these are all biological therapies. I can give you drugs, I can change the electrical stimulation of your brain, or I can actually remove uh, or separate parts of brain from one another. I wanna say uh, good morning to Medina. Uh, thank you for coming in the house this morning. Uh, if anybody else is on the chat bar and wants to uh, check in, uh, feel free to say good morning on the chat bar. But thanks for coming today, Medina. It's good to see you. And by the way, I'm glad you made it into this class. Remember, you came just, a, I think you were the student that came just a hair late. And I am so glad you came, Medina, and were able to join the class and stay this semester. Okay, now, so one big approach is this biological therapy. Now, within, uh, so you have biological therapy. A second broad tool in the toolbox is what we would call psychotherapy or talk therapy. And in these types of therapy, we're not looking to change the structural organization of the brain. Instead, we're talking to people, trying to help them, uh, so trying to help them uh, talk through the problems in their brain. We call it talk therapy. Um, and if you remember, we talked about operant and classical conditioning. I talked to you about little Albert, uh, who was conditioned to have a phobia by John Watson. Um, I talked to you about systematic desensitization. You know what? These are all come from Chapter 6, and they represent behavioral therapies that are used to treat psychological disorders. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about systematic desensitization and exposure and response uh, prevention. Okay. Uh, hi, Lewis. Thanks for checking in today. I see Lewis is going to be with us periodically. He's getting a checkup from the dentist. Good for you uh, following up with that good dental health. See your dentist twice a year. Keep those cavities away. You only get one set of teeth, so you have to make sure that they're in good shape, Lewis. So we've got behavioral therapy in Chapter 6. Now in Chapter 7, we talked about schemas, 
We talked about people's ways of processing information. And in chapter 11, I talked about stress and how I suggested to you that stress was really more about how you interpret events than what the actual events are. And so what we're going to talk about a little bit with cognitive therapy is cognitive therapy therapists engage in what we call cognitive restructuring. They try to change the habits of thinking that we have in our brain that lead to psychological disorders. Okay. And then the cognitive behavioral approach combines both of these approaches, cognitive restructuring, as well as setting up reinforcement and punishment paradigms. And these are all designed to, uh, to affect our behavior that way. Um, so we've got three different kinds of talk therapy, one based on behaviorism, one based on cognitive psychology, and then one, uh, the modern approach is sort of a blend of both called CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so these are the tools that we have to treat people with. This very of the disorder, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, your doctor will choose one or more of these strategies to treat your psychological disorders. In fact, we often talk about sort of the blended approach, if you will. Most of you uh, who've ever been diagnosed with depression probably receive a drug therapy. Yes, and you probably spend a uh, second this way down here in the bottom corner and then you probably regular talk to a regularly talk to a psychologist who spends this is called the eclectic approach so some people will actually get more than one approach at the same time and they're all directed in helping a person uh uh that happens to be by Or we don't exactly know what causes psychological disorders biologically. We don't understand the full mechanisms for how they develop, what causes them to last, and the kinds of things that will really make them go away. So these therapies, uh, in a certain extent, I won't say experimental, but these therapies are not always designed with, uh, uh, with the belief that they're going to be 100% effective. And in fact, one of the things that, there, that uh, the APA will do and research scientists do is they compare these therapies uh, against each other in terms of effectiveness. And they compare these uh, therapies against no therapy. Uh, you know, sometimes psychological disorders, just like medical illnesses, get better and go away. Um, and so uh, clinical psychologists uh, and other researchers are interested um, and treatments that are better than doing nothing at all. And so what you're going to see is there are research studies showing whether or not a treatment is better than nothing at all, and then whether or not a treatment is better than other active treatments you might use. And the idea is the reduction of symptoms that people self-report. Remember, 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 there are no biological tests, no blood tests, no x-ray, no scan that I can do to see if you have a psychological disorder. Instead, I judge the successfulness of my treatment program based upon your behavior, what you say, and what you feel, which is a different, interesting way. It's a difficult way to uh, treat psychological disorders. Could you imagine treating, uh, treating, um, uh, uh, high cholesterol levels and a blockage in a person's heart by just asking them how they feel uh, after you give them the medicine. You wouldn't do that. Instead, you'd go in and do a brain uh, by a body scan of some sort to see whether or not your medicine is actually having the intended biological effect. We don't have that here in clinical psychology. We're simply asking, do these treatments make your self-reported symptoms go away? Okay. So let's talk a little bit about behavioral therapies. Um, if you remember in laboratory, probably several weeks ago, I showed you a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a uh, video of a lady suffering from coulophobia, the irrational fear of clowns. And so uh, what you're going to see <clears throat> is that she was uh, given 
what's called exposure therapy, exposure and response prevention may be another way to put it. And basically, what the doctor did was brought her into the laboratory to face her feared object and talked her through the situation. So if you'll remember, uh, in exposure therapy, we think that people have a classically conditioned response of fear, of anxiety, that some sort of target elicits every time. So for this lady, when she saw a clown, she freaked out and got incredibly afraid. People with claustrophobia, when they see the inside of the car, they're like, nope, I can't get in there. I'm totally scared. And so there are certain events that cause these emotional responses that are problematic for people. So in people with therapies, people with uh, sort of these targeted anxiety uh, problems, what you may use is exposure therapy. So what the doctor does is you expose the client to the feared object, then walk them through their fear so they can associate a new, less arousing motion, emotion with the feared object. So if you'll remember the coulrophobia video, the client that had the phobia got with the doctor beforehand, and they sat down and talked extensively about what was going to happen if this client saw a clown. What's going to happen? Well, I'm going to get I'm going to get scared. This is true. What else is going to happen? Well, my heart's going to start beating and my breath is going to uh, increase. I'm going to start hyperventilating. Okay, great. And what else might happen? Well, I'm going to start shaking. Great. Fantastic. Is any of this going to cause harm to you? No, it is not going to cause harm. So before they go into the uh, actual trial, uh, the clinical psychologist and the, and the patient will sit down and carefully talk about how the stimulus is going to make them feel. And the reason you do this beforehand is because you can't talk to a client when they're terrified, but you can talk to them before they're terrified. So before he showed the client the clown, he, he exposed the client to the clown, he sat through and they talked intellectually about all of the feelings his client was going to feel and how it was going to make her react and how her body was going to respond. And then they clearly uh, talked about why this wasn't a serious thing and how this would eventually get better. So in the exposure therapy, the doctor set this client up beforehand and helped them prepare for the emotional event. And then if you'll remember in the video I showed you with coulrophobia, the lady actually uh, uh, went into the uh, set, set setting. They had a clown come in um, and she started to have her phobic reaction. Now, the clinical psychologist was sitting right beside her, coaching her through this event. See what's happening? Your heart's starting beating. See what's happening? You're starting to hyperventilate. You're starting to shake. Do you remember we talked about that? And the lady, in her terror, terror still can answer the doctor. Yes, I remember that. And so what the doctor does is guides her through an exposure to this feared object by providing her a little support. And what typically happens with people who have a phobia of an object is if they are around that object long enough, they realize that the phobia doesn't make sense and the fear dissipates. The reason phobias exist is because most people reinforce their phobia. If I have fear of clowns and I know there's a clown in that other room, I will run away from that room, and that is a reinforcing behavior. And so nobody ever really faces their targeted fears, and because they do this, they never get over their fears. With this behavioral te te uh, technique of exposure, what I'm doing is I'm bringing you into my laboratory, preparing you for the reaction you're going to have to that feared object, and then I'm going to expose you to that object and let you experience that fear while scaffolding you so that, such that you can associate a new and less arousing emotion to the feared object. Okay, And that's what we call exposure therapy. And that can happen in a relatively short time, maybe one or two or three visits uh, with your uh, clinical psychologist. You can work through a phobia or fear using exposure therapy. Now... Uh, another way, uh, another form of treatment for, uh, for, for uh, phobias is what's known as systematic desensitization. And this is gradual exposure to the feared uh, object. 
Now, with exposure therapy, I'm basically going to bring you face to face with that thing that causes your phobia immediately. You're going to have an incredible emotional reaction, and we're going to try to work through it and let that emotion dissipate. In systematic desensitization, what we're going to do is we're going to do the therapy, and our goal is going to be not to have an emotional response at all. Okay, so what I do is I uh, bring you into my, and this is going to take, uh, since it says gradual and not uh, instant exposure, systematic desensitization is going to take a little bit longer. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you into the lab and I'm going to teach you how to relax yourself uh, intentionally, okay? Slow your breathing down. Find your happy spot. Relax. I'm going to teach you a relaxation technique. And then we're also going to come up with fear hierarchy. Uh, if you remember from chapter 6 when we talked about fear hierarchies, I said the fear hierarchy is a list of presentations of the feared object uh, going from something that you can probably stand all the way up to the scariest exposure that you could ever have with that feared object. I think the example I used in chapter 6 uh, was uh, to help someone uh, uh, get over uh, the treatment for arachnophobia. And so let's go to our uh, so uh, uh, fear hierarchy. Okay, and so the one thing is the word spider written on a board. Now, here's the deal. If you have a phobia of spiders, I guarantee you that just seeing the word spider is probably going to cause a small emotional reaction in you. Not a big one, but your body is going to register the fact that you have a phobia of spider. So that's sort of, but that's the least scary thing you can do. And then what I might do is I might have a stuffed animal spider. And then I might have a dead spider in glass. And then a dead spider no glass. And then I'm going to have a live spider in glass, six, live spider, no glass, and then seven is hold a spider. Now this is an example of a fear hierarchy, and a fear hierarchy is going to be unique for each and every person. It's what the exposure, uh, what kinds of exposures to the feared stimulus uh, uh, represent to you. So if your feared stimulus is a tiger, we'll be a fear hierarchy for a tiger. If your uh, is a closed off spaces, we're going to find a fear hierarchy that uh, escalates uh, the closed in spaces that you experience. And the idea is what we're going to do is I'm going to teach you how to relax and then we're going to present you each step on this uh, fear hierarchy and ask you to learn how to control your emotions when you experience that thing. This is kind of like classical conditioning in, in reverse. So what I'll do is I get you into a relaxed uh, mood and then I write the word spider on the board and I tell you to relax, intention, relax, relax, relax. And you do that. Now here's the deal. In systematic desensitization, if you start to lose control, I'm not going to guide you through it. Instead, I'm going to take the stimulus completely away and get you back into that relaxed spot. And then I'm going to bring that stimulus back in. And what we're going to do is we're going to practice with each level of this fear hierarchy until you can be exposed to it without having the emotional response. So first I'm going to have you relax till you can look at the word spider on a board. Then I'm after we master that, I'm then going to bring a stuffed animal spider, put it in the lab, and practice And once you get over that, I'll bring in a spider that's been placed underneath one of those glasses. And we'll try to maintain our relaxation. And the idea is what we want to do is we want to prepare this new emotion, relaxation, each level of the fear hierarchy. Now, in truth, we're never going to get to the top of the fear hierarchy. Nobody ever gets to the point where they can truly overcome a phobia like that. What I want to do is to increase your effectiveness as a person. 
So if your fear of spiders keeps you from going out in outside of your house, we need to make that a little bit better. Do I need you to uh, eventually want to get a tarantula as a pet? Absolutely not. What I want you to do is to become desensitized to the feared object enough so that you can function in your day-to-day -day life. If you're claustrophobic, I don't want to make you perfectly claustrophobic, claustrophobia free, but if I can just get if I can just decrease your level of fear related to closed in spaces enough so that you can get in your car and drive to work, then I feel like I have solved your phobic problem. So exposure therapy and systematic desensitization are sort of two ways of trying to pair an old, a new uh, emotional response with an old uh, uh, target. So what we're trying to do is to get rid of a new an old learned response and replace it with a new, more adaptive uh, emotional response. And so you're going to find a lot of exposure therapy and systematic desens exposure therapy and systematic desensitization. Those kind of things are going to be uh, useful for treating phobias. That's sort of the tool that your psychologist will use if you have some sort of phobic uh, emotional reaction. Now, uh, one of the things that you'll also see is applied behavioral analysis. We talked about that in week six. Um, uh, clinical psycholo uh, psych psychologists also will use social skills and, and applied behavioral analysis to help people learn more adaptive daily habits. So social skills training is teaching that autistic kid how to shake hands um, when they meet people, how to say their name, how to do their appropriate thing uh, uh, with uh, a, a kid who has autism. So what you're trying to do is to teach that child functional abilities. And in a, an applied behavioral analysis, we're using reinforcers and punishers to train the kid's behavior. So you may play a game with a child, an autistic child, trying to teach them their colors. That's an adaptive bit of knowledge that we all need to learn that maybe autistic kids uh, either don't know or can't verbalize. And so what you'll do is you'll play uh, a game, whereas when the kid uh, names the right color, you may give them a small reward. And so applied behavioral analysis is a behavioral technique that is used to provide interventions um, in uh, people who have developmental problems. Specifically, you're going to see a lot of it in autism, uh, in, aut in the treatment of autism. And then social skills training, it's kind of the same thing, uh, using reinforcements and punishments uh, to help people learn new adaptive behaviors. So schizophrenics a lot of times are going to have um, um, uh, hygiene issues. They're not as interested in hygiene as the rest of us are. And so what you might do as a therapist is along with the drug therapy that you, the antipsychotic drugs that you give to that schizophrenic to make their hallucinations go away, you may use reinforcers and punishers to try and encourage that schizophrenic person to engage in adaptive behaviors. And like I said, uh, a lot of times, one of the things that you find with these schizophrenics is a lack of focus on hygiene that is problematic for some people. Okay, now uh, that those are behavioral techniques. Now, what's uh, what's most common now is cognitive restructuring, and cognitive restructuring comes from the social cognitive movement that grew out of what we call the reciprocal determinism uh, movement. Most beliefs uh, are learned habits of thinking, and these habits of thinking may or may not reflect reality, and these habits of thinking may or may not be adaptive. And so what we want to do with cognitive restructuring is your uh, clinical psychologist figures out what types of habits of thinking that you have that are inaccurate and are psychologically impairing. So the doctor's interested in treating your cognitive distortions. They're, those are these patterns of thinking that are not true and not, not adaptive, right? 
So uh, every time, if every time you take a test, if you don't make an A, you may fall into a sense of depression where you think about what a loser you are. I didn't make an A in this class, so this means I'm the stupidest person in the world. And you fall into this depression where you think about how worthless and how much you hate yourself. And you've experienced depression. And the reason you're experiencing depression is because you have this inaccurate habitual thought that pops into your brain. Every time you don't make an A in a class, you think, I'm a loser. A, that's inaccurate. And B, that is psychologically impairing because it causes you to fall off into a state of depression. So what you have is a cognitive distortion. And what I need to do as a clinical psychologist is I need to train you a new habit of thinking. And so what I'll do is I'll bring you into the laboratory and I will refute and challenge these beliefs that you have and help you come up with new ways of interpreting uh, your, the events that happen to you in your life, which will hopefully lead to new, more adaptive emotions. So if you came into my office and I found that you, you were suffering from depression and you told me it's because you were no good at anything and then I started talking to you and I found that the root of the problem is every time you don't make an A on an assignment or in a class, you fall into this state of depression. Well, there you go. I see the nugget. I see the, I see the habit of thinking, which is non-adaptive. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to challenge you on that. We're going to sit in the office when you're not feeling this emotion. And we're going to talk yeah. about the reality of it. And the idea is that I'm eventually going to get you to sort of understand that you're engaging in a negative pattern of thinking, a negative habit of thinking. And so then what we'll do is in our office, we will practice reframing these events. So I'll say, okay. Uh, I may even walk you through it. You may bring your test uh, score without looking at it into my office. We look at it together. You see it's a B. And then we practice going through the new sets of habits, of thought habits. And just like you can change any other habit, a smoking habit, a drinking habit, a habit of, going, uh, of, of doing bad things or whatnot, any habit you have can't be changed. Habits are difficult to change, you folks all who tried to quit smoking or tried to lose weight or tried to start exercising and realized that habits are difficult to change. However, they can be changed. And what cognitive restructuring does is it tries to change the habits of thinking that we may have. Now, what are some non-irrational beliefs? Uh, you know, there may be any number of unique, specific, self-defeating beliefs that you have, but your book is going to list some categories if you will, some common cognitive distortions that people have. Some people like to use the word I should or I must. There are very few things in life that you should or you must do. But when people set those situations up and then they don't happen, people get depressed and sad. I must make an A, but you didn't make an A this time. Well, so if I must make an A and I don't, then that's going to send me into a state of depression. So what I want to do is I want to teach you how not to use those words and have those thoughts of must or I should. Uh, you know, <clears throat> things happen, good things and bad happen. Some people tend to focus only on the negative things and they tend to think of the negative things as being worse than they actually are. Do any of you ever have a friend that uh, when bad things happen, they freak out and flip out like it's the worst thing that ever happened in the whole wide world. That person is catastrophizing. You know, there are very few horrible, horrible things that happen to you in life. Most things are minor annoyances. But some people are in the habit of saying that everything that happens to them that's not perfect is the worst thing that ever happened. And so your cognitive psychologist, uh, excuse me, your clinical psychologist, is going to attack this irrational, self-defeating belief. Some people ju uh, jump to conclusions, and you assume if your person doesn't come and pick you up, or is late for the meeting, or doesn't come out to meet you at the restaurant or the bar or wherever it is you're going, uh, we automatically jump to conclusions and assume that people don't like us, that we did something wrong. You know, a lot of times we make assumptions about events that turn out to be wrong. Why didn't that person talk to me? 
Well, it's because that person doesn't like me because I'm unlovable. Whoa, you just jumped to conclusions, my friends. Maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they're busy. Maybe somebody just hurt their feelings and they don't feel like talking. Why are you jumping to conclusions? And I guarantee you that a lot of people go ahead and jump to the most negative possible explanation for events that happen to them. That's sort of a, and that's another maladaptive habit of thinking that you need to get rid of or your clinical psychologist can help you get rid of, right? And uh, some people uh, don't pay attention to the positive things and they just focus on the negative things in life, right? So when I made a bad grade, uh, when I did, let's say I turned in a paper in graduate school and it wasn't accepted uh, very well, uh, what I did was I said, wow, I am the worst person in the entire world. Look at this, look at this, look at this. Well, what I forgot to mention was I finished my four-year degree. I was actually lucky enough to get into graduate school. All these good things happened, but why are you only focusing on the negative, Chris? You ever notice, do you, any of you have friends who just don't pay attention to any positive thing that happens in their life? Instead, they just focus on the negative. Again, that's another self defeat defeating habit of thinking. And then some people always take things personally. You know what, Buttercup? Sometimes it's not about you. But most of us think it is about us because you are the main actor in the play called Your Life, right? The drama called Your Life. Most of us think that everybody is thinking about us and acting with us in mind. You know what? No, they're not. Uh, you shouldn't take things as personally as you do. So, uh, quickly, I noticed we've got some people on the chat here. How many of you have engaged in some of these irrational beliefs? Do any of you have the term I should popping out of your mouth a lot? How many of you uh, think that everything that happens to you is the worst thing uh, ever? Do any of you jump to conclusions and make assumptions that you shouldn't based on uh, things that people do? Uh, how many of you Focus on the negative and never pay attention to the good things that happen in your life. And how many of you take everything personally? These, in a sense, are non-adaptive habits of thinking. And what cognitive psychologists do is they attempt to change these beliefs. So if I notice that you are a ca catastrophic kind of person, you're depressed, you come into my office, uh, Lewis says he sometimes focuses on the negative more. Yeah, yeah, I have to admit, Lewis, I, I, I do the same thing, uh, too. All these great things that happened in my life, and I focus on the one person that pissed me off, the one thing that didn't turn out right, you know? I rem and I, I know exactly where I got this. I got this from my, my dad. He, unfortunately, my dad was the kind of guy that always wanted me to do better. He was always pushing me to do better. So no matter what I did, my dad was always focused on the weakness, the mistake, the thing I needed to get better at. Now, in my dad's mind, he thought he was helping me uh, get better and, and develop myself. And he thought he was doing a good thing. And this is what a lot of parents do. But by continually focusing on every negative thing that ever happened and never really spending time talking to me about the positive things that happened, my dad in a sense, through no fault of his own and with good intentions, trained me to have this irrational belief to always focus on the negative. How many of you had parents that always seemed to focus on the things that you could do better, the things that you could improve? That's great, and that's a well-meaning uh, that's a well-meaning uh, strategy. But the problem with it is, is you're teaching your child to always focus on their shortcomings rather than the things that they are good at. That's a self-destructive uh, thought pattern. And so here's the deal. What we do is you come into my office as a psychologist. We spend some time talking, and I notice that you are engaging in some of these cognitive distortions. My job is to then point these out to you, make them aware, because most of the hab habitual things that people do they do mindlessly. So you probably, uh, Lewis, if you're sort of a negative kind focused person and you focus on the negative more, you probably aren't even aware of it. You probably do it 
just without even thinking, like most habitual behaviors. And so what I need to do is I need to make you aware of that. That's the first thing we need to do. Now, uh, I wrote in parentheses reality testing. Sometimes we have to show you how they're uh, not correct. So you might come into my office being a depressed person, and you might say to me, Doctor, nobody likes me. I have zero friends at all. I am so lonely because I have new, no friends. Now that's irrational and it's probably not true and it's certainly not helpful. So what I might do is I might engage in a reality test. I may say, okay, uh, Lewis, if you think that's how you really are, pull out your phone. Who's in your contact list, your friends? And we'll call 10 of your friends. And after each phone call, you and I will talk and we'll say, all right, was that person happy? To, did they sound like they were happy to hear from you? And what I'll do is I'll go through 10 of your friends in your phone contact list. We'll call them all and ask you how happy they were to hear from you. And nine of them sound really, really happy when you call them. And then I'm going to look at you and I'm going to say, Lewis, okay, we started the day. You told me that you had no friends and nobody liked you. We just called 10 of your contacts and nine of them seemed really, really uh, interested in hearing from you. And six of them even asked you to go out and do something fun next week. Now, uh, are you behaving rationally or irrationally? And so the idea is to show the person their habit of thinking, make them aware of it, and even prove it to them if possible. So what we do is we become aware, the clinical psychologist in this job, their job is to make you aware of these, okay, and to sort of coach you up so that you become the kind of person uh, that notices when these happen. So, uh, Lewis, you might tell me you're depressed and you might say that every time something bad happens, it sends you into this depression and you just can't get out of this depression. And it's because events in life are making you depressed. It's not you, it's the events in your life. Well, what I would do is I would make you aware of the fact that your interpretations of these events is worse than they are, okay? You're catastro cata catastrophizing this event right here. You're catastrophizing this event. You're catastrophizing this event. And what I show you, is, what we do uh, in, in our office is we talk so that we know in what situations are you most likely to engage in this catastrophic thinking. Anytime you get feedback from school, it sends you into a depression. All right, so now we know that uh, you have this problem where you focus on the negative, and it always happens when you get feedback from school. Now, here's the key to my therapeutic process. Once I make you aware of it, what it is, and when it happens, we then set it up so that you try to stop yourself whenever this event starts to happen and become aware of yourself. And then we give you new interpretations that you then use. So, uh, Lewis, you get depressed every time you get a B minus or a B or anything that's not an A on a grade or an exam. No matter how small or insignificant, it always freaks you out. In fact, Lewis, let's say hypothetically, missed discussion board number four and his attendance grade went from 100 to a 90. Most people wouldn't care. But that sent Lewis into a tailspin uh, where he was depressed for three days and couldn't get out of bed because he missed a discussion board and I gave him a 90 instead of a 100. He freaks out. So what we do is we talk about that, and Lewis notices that when he got some feedback, he focused on the negative, and it sent him into a state of depression because he said this is the worst thing that ever happened. So now, the next time Lewis gets some feedback, my goal as a therapist is to make sure that Lewis, when he gets that ne negative feedback and his mind starts to think negative things, he catches himself. Hey, wait a minute. Dr. Roddenberry told me about these events. This is one of those negative events. What do I usually do? I do this. But what did Dr. Roddenberry and I practice in his office? Okay, there are other grades. I can still bring my grade up to an A. I'm still a smart person, even if I make a B on an assignment or a B in this class. And so what I do is we engage in practicing new habits of interpreting the events in our life. This is called cognitive restructuring. And that's basically what cognitive psychologists do.
Look at the uh, explanation below. My boss yelled at me. Most people will take that personally, right? I'm a worthless person. If you feel like you're a worthless person, of course, the appropriate emotion is to feel depressed. If you are worthless, of course you should. You hate yourself. I mean, that's a normal experience for people to have. If I felt totally worthless and completely unloved, of course, that would make me sad. That's not adaptive. That's, this is literally you, Medina. Okay, well, you know what, Medina? It's literally a lot of people. It's literally me. It's little, literally everybody in the world. Because we grew up in a world where we're always getting feedback, and that feedback's always negative, or that feedback's always telling us that we need to be faster, or stronger, or smarter, or better. The world sets us up in these negative uh, habits of thinking, Medina. So what we need to do, what hopefully you can do as a result of this class, Medina, is you can think about today, uh, you can sit down and think about those situations that really cause you to spin off into these emotional events that you have, if you're like me. And what you need to do is sit down and see if you can come up with an alternate evaluation of the event. Do it before the event happens, because when the event happens, you get caught up in your emotion and it's hard to think rationally. But if you practice that, my boss yelled at me, so I'm going to imagine my boss giving me negative feedback. She said, Chris, your teaching is problematic. You need to do this and this and this. What I'll do is I'll say, okay, now was my boss talking specifically about me or was she just giving me advice? And so I practice this reinterpretation. When it events happens, Medina, hopefully you will have the ability to stop that automatic thought replace it with a more adaptive thought, which leads to a more positive emotion. Sounds easy. Very, very difficult. Habits are difficult things to change. Habits take intentional effort to change. You can do it, Medina. You can do it, Lewis. You can do it, Chris Roddenberry. But you have to practice these new habits. And I'm telling you, I still take things super duper personally and I get very and I'm very very sensitive to rejection when people have a bad day and they say something rude to me or treat me rudely I always get really angry and take it personally I forget so often that people have lives outside of Chris Roddenberry and so if they're acting mean to Chris Roddenberry it is not because of him but it's because of the situation and so I really 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 have to practice that thought pattern and it keeps me from getting depressed. Now, when somebody treats me meanly, um, I don't take it personally as much. I am able to look at that person's situation and maybe put the focus on them and not me. And this has allowed me to be a little bit happier in my adult life. I promise you, I still need more cognitive restructuring therapy, but it has helped me be a little bit happier because the things that used to send me into a depression and make me really sad don't do it anymore because I'm able to sort of uh, move myself to more positive thoughts. Medina, you can do it, girl. <clears throat> and then cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, that's what everybody's doing now. The past week, specifically on Sunday when I was working, it got stressful to the point that I felt I was letting down my managers. Absolutely. There you go, uh, Lewis. And so uh, I didn't do this. I'm letting down my manager. Now, really, uh, if you showed up and you're trying your best, are you letting down your manager? Think about it. Most people are not coming to work. Your manager has difficulty getting people to show up. When people show up, they don't seem to care at all. But yet, Lewis, you show up and you seem to care. And so this idea that your boss would be let down by you is probably untrue. What you ought to think is my boss is actually just glad that I'm here and I'm trying. But I totally get uh, what you're talking about, Lewis. Uh, uh, I have the same feelings. So thank you for mentioning that in class. Now your goal, Lewis, is to work on a new emotional feeling. What's going to trigger that feeling that you're letting your boss down? What's the triggering event? What are the negative thoughts? Write down some positive thoughts. Maybe even put them on a slip of paper. When you go to work and that triggering event happens again, uh, Lewis, pull that piece of paper out and practice those new thoughts. 
and you can do this, Medina. I'm glad to see you saying that. I like the positivity. Positivity is the first step to changing. Now, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy kind of uses both of these approaches. So we're going to do the cognitive restructuring, but then we also may set up some sort of tokens where you can sort of reward yourself for the behaviors uh, that you are doing. So every time you engage in this positive restructuring, let's find a way to reward ourselves for doing that. And so what we're doing uh, is we set up uh, we, we set up situations where people can then reinforce themselves for engaging in successful cognitive restructuring. So, Medina, what you need to do is find that triggering event that causes the negative self-talk. Practice, uh, write down some positive self-talk that you could say to yourself and put it in your pocket. When that event happens and you start to get those feelings, you pull that piece of paper out, you talk about it, right? And then you find yourself some way to reinforce your new positive behavior. This is sort of what we call cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is the most common type of therapy that you will find out there. Every doctor you go to is doing cognitive behavioral therapy. It's used in the treatment of many disorders, anxiety-related disorders, mood disorders, eating, eating, eating disorders. It's, uh, it's, it's everywhere. And you'll look at this chart below me. What it's going to suggest to you, uh, oh, actually, wrong chart, wrong chart. And so uh, it's going to be a very useful way of treating your uh, disorders. Now, uh, one other thing is called exposure and response prevention. One of the things that we can do, especially with people who have OCD, is we try to break the link between their obsessive thought and their compulsive behavior. So what we do is we set up situations where we can trigger that obsessive thought and then we're there with the patient and we help them avoid from engaging in the compulsive behavior that they have. So there are some people who have hand washing compulsions. It's because they're afraid of germs and bacteria. And this fear is so strong that it drives them to wash their hands 10, 15, 100 times a day. And so what we do is we bring them into the lab. We have them think about those compulsive thoughts. They want to wash their hands, but then we keep them from washing their hands. And we practice not washing our hands after we have our compulsive thought. And what we try to do is we try to break the link between that obsessive thought and that compulsive behavior. And this chart right under here shows me that uh, shows you <clears throat> that using exposure and response prevention along with drug therapy is going to be way more effective in treating OCD than just using uh, drug therapy by itself. Okay, we are out of time. It is 9.52. Uh, Medina, Lewis, thank you for, for sharing today. Uh, you are not different from everybody else. You are just like everybody else. In fact, the only thing that makes you different, Lewis and Medina, is that you demonstrated some self-awareness today. You realize, just like I realize, that we have negative habits of thinking. The key to our happiness and our success, Medina and Lewis, uh, is learning how to replace these negative self-defeating thoughts with positive, uh, successful, and adaptive thoughts. I know you can do it. All right, folks, it is 9.53. I've got to log off now and get to my next class, but it was great seeing you folks, and I hope you join me tomorrow at, uh, at, uh, at um, 9 o'clock because it will be the last live lecture of the semester. I really enjoyed being with everybody, but I am going to miss you, uh, so please, uh, join me tomorrow for my last lecture, okay? You folks have a great day, uh, and I will see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Bye.